time of the U.N. is the time of the U.N. Yeah, okay. 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 So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this talk now about how to teach a revolution. It's interesting, we have how to teach a revolution question mark. I'm not sure if that's a question, really, or, or more of a statement. We're here, to, in any case, to talk to Sergio Popovich about how to teach a revolution, and he has lived his entire adult life as a revolutionary. He's a pacifist who, he travels the world now to countries like Burma, Egypt, Georgia, Iran, Tunisia, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe, not the most stable places uh, you can think of. And he teaches activists there about nonviolent resistance. He was also a founder of Otopor, if I'm, Otopor, <laughs> pronouncing that correctly, which is a Serbian youth movement that toppled Slobodan Milosevic in 2000. Today, he's seeking to educate people who are pro-democratic on how to resist oppression and do this in a progressive, non-violent, and even entertaining way. So he founded a center for applied non-violence action and strategies called Canvas, and he was also named Foreign Policy's Top 100 Global Thinkers, and he's the author of a book called Blueprint for Revolution, which in German is translated as Protest. He was previously also um, from this youth movement onwards, has been active as an activist uh, in many ways, not only through Canvas, but also privately as a teacher. So, uh, Serja, we're going to start out this conversation here with a very simple question. Why should people, or why do people, start a revolution? And is this possible anywhere in the world? Well, from my modest experience, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to connect with amazing people. It's a great way to feel good about yourself. It's a great way to change where you live. It's a great way to address the things that you are unhappy with, and it can be hell of a fun. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. Uh, starting back there, I, I was never thinking I'm going to become a, a revolutionary. I was born in former Yugoslavia, and uh, until I was 19 or 20, my biggest concern was uh, how to play in a rock band. And I used to play a bass guitar in a goth rock band, uh, very popular at the time, because this is how you got the dates uh, back there in, in, in 80s and 90s. And then the, you, at some point, understand that, uh, uh, that you, can, you can become active. And people very often look at the movement in Serbia, which was kind of amazing. Uh, average age of the people was 21. It was facing a pretty brutal guy called Slobodan Milosevic. It succeeds where everybody else failed. Opposition failed, international community failed, uh, bombs failed, and we somehow succeeded. And people are looking at this movement and say, you know, what really, how amazing you young people were. Uh, we were not uh, the activists by choice. We were activists because we didn't have choice. And uh, very often life puts you in a position where you need to take choice. And how many of you have watched Lord of the Rings? That's a pretty decent crowd. Okay, so uh, who are the main characters in Lord of the Rings? Hobbits. Uh, are they strong, powerful, great uh, warriors? No. They are small, laid-back people, people like you and me. And, but it is them who, who uh, really win the war at the end. Uh, very similarly, in Serbia, we, we figured out throughout the 90s, and Serbs are very slow learners. Uh, we started by 1992, a student demonstration, very much of the occupied type, locking down on universities, singing, all we are saying is give peace a chance. And of course, Milosevic didn't care. He would bring foreign journalists, showing them that we are having our little democratic zoo, and in the same time, he was sending tanks to Croatia and Bosnia. We matured a little bit in 1996, 97, uh, we kind of joined forces with the opposition, won the local elections, marched for 100 days, and then we won uh, for the first time uh, uh, the mayorship of Belgrade and things of that kind. And of course, took the stupid opposition seven months to split and destroyed the hardly won victory. And then we figured out like, that like Frodo Baggins, there will be nobody else to take this ring to Mordor. It has to be us. And this is probably the moment where we start playing on many different fronts. Uh, but from our own experience, experience uh, of the people from many countries we work, uh, yes, change is possible. Yes, it starts with a dream. Uh, yes, the people will tell you it is impossible. But throughout the history and throughout the, the work we do, we figured out that uh, a small committed group of the people can change the world. And in fact, if you look at the good things uh, that are shaping our world, a lot of them were done by hobbits. Uh, 
Uh, take a look at the, at the Lech Walesa, the electrician from shipyard in Gdansk with no formal education at all. Take a look at the Marlura King, the village priest. Take a look at some of the other unlikely heroes of nonviolent struggle, and you will see that it is a small, committed group of common people. The reason why I'm so passionate about the nonviolent social movements is that, by my opinion, it is far the best way for common people to create the large social changes as opposed to the elite-driven changes, which are more common, and you know, you see them on every step. Uh, probably from my hotel to here, I walked through the 15 different billboards advertising this party or that party on Austrian elections, but nonviolent movements are something different. They are very unique animals, and you're going to meet uh, strange people, amazing people, inspiring people if you go that path. So yes, change is possible. Yes, anybody can become an activist, and yes, it's a thrilling job, and sometimes it can be very, very funny. <laughs> So, well, um, now that we all know that the hobbits are the real movers and shakers of the world, um, you, you also are a proponent of, of not only nonviolence, but specifically um, humor and jokes as being, being the more powerful way to make sustainable change than with guns and violence. So how do you think that fum like humor, give us an example maybe of how humor has fueled the fires of a revolution? But first of all, you don't take Serbs never too seriously. So the part of this coming from, from our national mentality. Uh, but basically, when you look at the, at the nonviolent struggles of 20th century, uh, and you take a look at the, I mean, there, there's a list of the revolutions in the agenda of this conference. And we gave the photos of all of this super serious guy, Lenin, and then you want to look at the Che, and then you want to look at the Castro, and they're really grim and serious and tough looking guys. And there was this theory uh, with so sociologists of uh, 19th and 20th century that, of course, the revolutionaries should be serious and passionate guys because they're involved in serious business of revolution. But if you look at contemporary revolutionaries, uh, you will look the protests that are looking like the festival. And more and more you see this uh, very strange and smiling face of the revolution. Uh, first of all, what history teaches us is that uh, nonviolent revolutions are twice more likely to succeed. There is an amazing study done by two American uh, scholars, Maria Stefan and Erika Chenovet, that are looking at the 323 different cases of violent and nonviolent struggle. And in fact, if you run a nonviolent movement, your chances to succeed are around 53% as compared to guerrilla war movement, foreign military intervention, where the chances are standing at 26%. So not only that the nonviolence is more ethical, it is twice more likely to succeed. So from nonviolence to fun and humor, uh, we normally being the students and opposing a grim bureaucratic and quite autocratic regime, uh, we were you know, making jo jokes about it. Uh, and political satire is a very important part of, of, of the game because it makes uh, people feeling grim in a very, uh, in a very, in a very uh, strange times. But when you look at the real art behind this, and this is the phenomenon we, we are looking at and we are studying, and it's called loftivism. So what would be the loftivism? Loftivism originates from a dilemma action, and the first uh, super successful dilemma action in the history of nonviolent struggle is Gandhi's salt march. Why? Because Gandhi knew if, uh, you know, he targeted assault, uh, he targeted a very important source of British income, he targeted something that every Indian needed for food, and he also targeted something which is senseless. Now, this is very important. What do you need to make salt? A piece of coast and a little bit of sun. India has 4.5 thousand miles of the sea line. So he says, okay, I'm going to go there, I'm going to make salt, and if they arrest me, I'm becoming a hero. If they, however, don't arrest me, then everybody is going to break this ban. So this is the dilemma component. And we figured it out in Serbia uh, with Milosevic, uh, who was kind of a great bureaucrat and not a really humorous uh, person himself. And you could tell that by the, by the pictures, but also the atmosphere in the society. And we started doing small pranks. And we were just a group of maybe 10, 11, 15 people. Otpor started, was founded by 11 people. And we came out to the, to the main pedestrian shopping zone with a little barrel, and barrel had a Milosevic face on it. The idea was that there was a hole on the barrel, you come in, and like in a piggy bank, you put a little coin in the barrel, you take a big baseball bat, and bam, you express your love for Mr. President. So what happened is that within the range of 15 minutes, there's like 200 people waiting in a queue to to hit the barrel. But that was not the funny part. The funny part was when police arrived. So what in the world they are going to do? 
arrest us, we are nowhere to be seen. We are like three blocks away having espressos. Arrest downtown shoppers, bring them to the police station and charge them with what? They will be out in 15 minutes. So of course they did the most stupid thing, they arrested the barrel. So the photograph of the barrel being dragged to the police car was of course on the cover page of the, of the newspapers. And we turn more important the symbol of fear, because the police was the main oppressive mechanism in Milosevic, Serbia, into the punchline. So everybody was having fun with this. Uh, fast forward to nowadays, uh, you can't almost find a movement which doesn't do something funny. And uh, this laughtivism is so present in nowadays movement. 2012, uh, Putin would probably won his, his elections anyhow, but some of his people were very enthusiastic in stuffing the boxes. So it was not to get 66%, it was to get 90 plus. And in some places even over 100. And what happens in the era of, of the cell phone, somebody taped it. And it went viral. So people knew that there were election fraud, the people were protesting in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, but protests were not allowed in smaller places. Uh, uh, Kremlin is one of the governments that holds the best when it comes to countering non-violent movement. They know this game. And in one of the small places, it's Barnaul in Siberia, which of course I can't find on the map, uh, what happened is that people said, if we can't protest, our toys can. So the people build a little Lego town, you know, they brought the, their kids' toys, and with a little kinder surprise, uh, uh, standards and they were standing with a, with a little banner saying 136% for Putin. Give us free and fair elections. And there is an actual footage sitting on the Guardian webpage about this and you can see the, the day one, uh, the, the people were there and the police was, were there and everybody was happy and taping and no tension at all, this is a small place, people know their policemen, blah 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 blah. But the problem started when things went viral. So 700,000 people have seen the YouTube clip with this only in the first night. And of course somebody have seen it in the Kremlin and say this is going to give ideas to the people because this is what these activities do. So the phone rang at the, at the police office in Barnaul and the poor chief of the police uh, had to step in front of the cameras uh, the day two and give probably the most stupid statement in the history of the police force, uh, which is to officially say that the protest scheduled by 100 legal toys, 30 toy cars, and 30 toy soldiers is banned because the toys are not citizens of Russia. And by constitution, only citizens of Russia can protest. Toys are probably made in China or something like that. So, but when you look at, at the wider implication of this, uh, from the point of nonviolent tactics, it's amazing. First, uh, how much money or people you need to stage this? It's very low entry point. Uh, second, uh, what is the message you're sending? Uh, you're looking at uh, Vladimir Putin, the person who often poses shirtless, wrestles with tigers, saves dolphins from drowning, and he's afraid of toys. And I mean, it's like the, 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 these type of activities show the real power of humor. And I think uh, in, in our research, the power of humor in nonviolent struggle is threefold. First, it breaks fear. And if you're fighting in oppressive environment, the fear is your enemy number one. If you're fighting in Austria, apathy is your enemy number one. Both cases, humor works. Imagine preparing for a surgery, and doctor is coming to you and say, okay, uh, this is what we are going to do. We are going to open your chest, and we are going to put these little things there. No, you, you don't want to hear about that. But then if your friend cracks a joke, you just laugh, and the fear goes away. So this is the first very important thing. Second. Uh, humor may, gives your movement a cool factor. So successful movements are not only committed, well organized, strategized, it's fun to be a part of. Because this drags people towards the groups. People feel good around cool people. And if you take a look at your, at your marvelous iPhone and, and ask yourself a question, okay, who is the most desirable person to be around? Is it the richest one? the cleverest one, the most educated one, or the one who can always make you laugh. That person is a winner. So everybody wants to be around funny people. And this is our human nature. Last but not the least importance, when you challenge people in power with humor, uh, they very often don't know what to do. Because sitting in power for a long time, seeing your face on the billboards, in the newspapers, on the TV, gives you the fake idea of yourself. 
So you're living in a very isolated world where you start believing this image of yourself. And, and I mean, Mubarak didn't believe he's out of power three days after he resigned because he just didn't think that this is possible. And, and when, when they are faced with a, with a toy protests or petrol barrels, they very often do something stupid. And then it becomes the next punchline for your movement. So looking at the lo loftivism is an important component of the movements, and there are, there are hilarious things people are doing across the world. Uh, recently, uh, the most effective thing, uh, which will probably relate to Austrian situation, is how you deal with neo-Nazis. There is this uh, small study we did about using the funny tactics to deal with alt-right. And of course, the first nerve you see and where Antifa people go wrong is that they yell and cry and shout and attack. And we will talk about this later, but you don't seek to overpower your enemy because what these groups are seeking is exactly that. They need to be proven that they are in danger, their freedom of speech is endangered, plus they have this uh, passion for showing mucho much a picture of themselves marching around in the uniforms, and this is best, uh, best met with violence. So the violence is the most stupid way to react on this. And there are three amazing cases, and uh, like two in your neighborhood. Uh, in Germany in, in 2000, uh, 2014, in a small place called Wundersdal or Wundersdale or Wu my German, is, yeah, my German is limited to the to the partisan movies from Second World War. I know Halt, Schnell, Auschwitz. This is this is where it ends. Okay, in a small German places where where Rudolf Hess yes, was born, which is really weird because it's a very liberal place nowadays, but it's a kind of mecca for these guys. So they go and organize march every year. So there was a group of activists coming to amazing idea that uh, they will unite the community in making a jiu-jitsu out of this march. So what happened is they persuaded every store in this small place to donate 100 euro per one meter of the march. Okay, so how this works is that they, they even paved the lines like, oh, congratulations, 1,000 euro, 3,000 euro, 5,000 euro. So when the, as these guys are marching, the local shops and, and businesses were donating to the organization called Exit Germany which is actually helping neo-Nazis to recover back to their brains. So this is one perfect example on how you can play a creativity against neo-Nazis. Another one is Finland. Uh, there, is a, there is a 2014, and especially with immigrant wave, there is this, uh, uh, it's called Soldiers of Odin. Neo-Nazis love this big world, and they're always soldiers of something. And of course, Odin is a supreme guard in Nordic mythology. And you can imagine that they are uh, a tall and, and black uniform. So they're marching between the immigrant neighborhood and the neighborhood where Finnish people live to protect Finnish people from immigrants. This is the message they want to send. Well, then they're met with another group of, of people called Lodlers of Odin. And they're all dressed as clowns. So now you have this stray of black people looking like idiots. And there is a stray of clown marching next to them. So these type of actions are showing that the power of humor is not limited to authoritarian places, but can also very, very uh, uh, big use against any kind of the, of the fringe and extreme groups. So essentially it's the, the humor kind of taking the power away from, from the uh, alt-right or, or, or far-right extremist movements. Um, I just have a quick question to the audience. Who here uh, was... Uh, a strong protester during their university days. Just put your hand up. When you were at university, who did a protest? Any protest, just one protest is enough. Put your hand up if you protested at university. Okay, we have 10, 15 people about, approximately. Okay, of those people, who protested after? Okay, one. Okay, two, two. three. Three people, okay. So I have a question here about, Canvas works a lot with universities. You have universities from Harvard to NYU to all over the United States and in Europe, throughout the world. So um, are you targeting mainly students? Are these the change makers? Are these the people that make revolutions possible? Are they the only pranksters that really make it happen? It's a very interesting question. Uh, the students are natural audience for this type of, of change uh, and you will see them on the brink of every nonviolent movement. And there are reasons for this. Uh, first of all, uh, they, they, they think they can change the world. And this is what comes naturally when you are in 20s. Uh, second, they don't have anything to lose except their crazy heads. 
Third, uh, very important reason, they have an influence in society because they are considered to be the future of society. So if they protest, the other people look at it and say, okay, something is wrong here. We need to pay attention. And last but not of least importance, uh, students never stand alone. They stand with their parents because everybody is first the parent and then he or she has a political point of view. But students themselves, they represent a small portion of society. So by themselves, they are not enough. So what you really want to do is, if you're working with the students first, your first idea, and that was our first idea in Serbia, is to look at your battleground. Because the theory of nonviolent struggle looks at the nonviolent struggle as a battle. And you're having this ground where you want to look at the terrain. And you want to look at the constituencies and parts of the societies and social groups you want to mobilize. For us in Serbia, it was first parents. So there was this, the first stray we made after the student branch was the resistful moms. So these are the moms of the students that were going on demonstrations, baking cakes, doing things. And then we did the grandmas of the movement and grandpas. And it's really interesting because these retired people have a lot of time on their hands. Is and there a reason why you, why you targeted women? Uh, well, yes, I mean, the women are, the, 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 the women were, were a very important part of this movement. The women, is, it, the women are seeing the world uh, uh, far more uh, rational and with less anger than, than the men. And it was, it was really like a gender balanced, balanced movement. I mean, Canvas is the organization. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, highly outnumbered. I am the one man working with five men, women in the office. So, I mean, it's like, a, I like how the women accept this type of knowledge. But from students to other constituencies, you need to build your numbers. Because the, there is a direct correlation, not only between the number of the people involved and the success of the nonviolent movement, but also diversity of the people involved. And nonviolent movements uh, are always, uh, or very often, uh, made of a very strange coalitions. So sometimes you will see, like, when you look at the solidarity movement in Poland, it was a Roman Catholic Church, blue-collar workers, and urban intelligentsia. Not really the guys you're going to see in bar around the beer. But you need to bridge these social distances in order to mobilize the wider portions of society. So students are the natural troublemakers, but students themselves are not enough. So you actually have outlined um, various times in the media and, uh, and, and in print um, in other places that uh, there are specific guidelines that you've made for a movement to have a significant and lasting impact. Um, and this, is, this can be used everywhere, you say, um, in every situation. And you say that step one of these five steps is to define the change you want to see. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, when you look at the, a lot of the movements have this anti this and anti that. They are anti-capitalist movement and there is a growing anti-Trump movement and there is, this is not the way to succeed. In order to succeed, movements need to draw people towards positive change, not against something. And you need to define this change. And this change uh, is called the vision of tomorrow. And in our workshops and in our classes, this is the class one. Sit down, take a look at the battlefield, start listening to your constituencies, and try to draw out the smallest common denominator. What is this little thing you can unite all of these groups around, and how do you formulate this thing? And it's normally the answer to the question, if I am the wizard for a day, what would be different? So you need to imagine this future and put this future in a, in a written document. So like if I ruled the world, what would I do? No, if you're Hermione Granger. Okay, okay. Uh, you say the second step is to shift the spectrum of allies. What's that? That's exactly what I'm saying. The spectrum of allies is a, is a practical world, word for, for uh, looking at the terrain. Sun Tzu says that you need to look at the terrain, uh, look at yourself and look at your enemy, and you will know the outcome of the thousand battles. So you look at the terrain and look what constituencies are there. Which social groups are leaning towards your vision? Which social groups are on the fence? And this is probably where the majority of the people are. And which social groups are opposed to the change you want to achieve? Whether the change is changing the government or, you know, change your three dogs. I mean, it's like whatever the change is. So you basically want to look how to bring uh, uh, these parts on your social, uh, social spectrum, but also how to design a campaigns and strategies to bring people from the middle. Because uh, uh, theory shows that these movements become successful when they become mainstream. So while they are on the extreme, there is no result. You feel good, you're right, but you are the handful of, of the people or handful of the groups. And very similarly, like environmental movement started as a group of uh, crazy hippies tying themselves for the fences of the nuclear power plants back there in the 60s. And then 
went to the point where you can't imagine the serious government anywhere in the world which doesn't have the environmental policy. So it kind of conquered the mainstream. And in order to do that, you need to know your battlefield, and that's called spectrum of allies. So you'll spend a day uh, banging your head, oh, what groups I want to mobilize and what is important for these groups, and why would they join? Then you say you have to identify the pillars of power. Who are the pillars of power? The pillars of power is uh, like the power in the society which you really want to shift is not exercised through individuals. It is exercised through institutions and organizations we call pillars of support. So what are these pillars that are supporting status quo and how do we pull the people from these pillars to support our vision of tomorrow? And this is the basic of your strategy. So in Serbia the basic thing was a to mute police pillar. Because that was the mo like the day when police didn't respond co to command was October the 5th, the day Milosevic was, was done. But it's very often more complicated than that because you have pillars which are made of different micro pillars. Like when you say media and then you have the conservative media and liberal media, this media and that media. But basically that, that points you to the fact that by analyzing the institutions you want to shift, you actually get the blueprint for your strategy. So what are you targeting is very important. In case of, you know, anti-capitalist movement, Occupy in the US. I was, I was sitting there when, when they were really big. And I was amazed uh, to how they are reluctant to even think about the pillars. Because, you know, they're sitting in a park 24 hours a day. How this uh, disrupts bank? If banking system is what they want to disrupt, they want to look at the number of the people pulling their accounts from the banks. They want to look at the businesses pulling back from the banks. They want to look at their business reply mail, put a brick in it, and send it back to the expense of the bank. So, you know, you are not starting your movement by tactics. You're starting your movement by vision, analyzing the pillars, targeting the right pillars, developing the strategy, and then tactics. When you talk about the, the stakeholders in these pillars, what would be an example of, of a successful way to target a stakeholder? Uh, one of the one of the easiest uh, easiest way to understand this is to uh, say the name of the very popular tactic, very popular case in history. Almost everybody know. It's called Montgomery bus boycott. You know what it was? Rosa Parks. No. Okay. So the group of of black people fighting for 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 uh, uh, racial equality. Uh, decided to do the serious pillar analysis. And they were looking at the southern states where segregation was present, so they couldn't pee in the same toilets as the white people to make it this really down to earth, and uh, drive in the same part of buses as the right people, and they couldn't eat in the food courts in the malls. So they say, what are our strengths and what are our opponent weaknesses? We can't persuade the power holders, the governors and the mayors, to shift the, the, the segregation policy because they get elected by 80% of the white people who like it. So it's a wrong pillar to attack. But they were looking at the businesses because in America everything is about the money. So they were looking at the businesses supporting these politicians. And tends that some of these businesses, namely transportation system, was very vulnerable to non-cooperation of the black people because the majority of the consumers of public transportation were black people. They didn't have car. So what happens is when they pull the support from the buses, then the owners of the bus companies went to white mayors and, 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 and persuaded them. So this is exactly the very clever pillar analysis. You look at the pillar that you can shift and you target the pillar where you are powerful in terms that you have leverage in numbers to really make change. And this pillar in their case was bus. That was their battleground. So the, bus, uh, the bus drivers or the, or the bus driving companies became the activists for the activists. They turned the bus driving companies and then they turned the malls because in the malls the, the food courts were segregated and, uh, and the Afro-Americans couldn't have food in the food courts. And that was of course senseless because they were m m majority of the consumers. And of course, the mall owners were li likely to get more money from their consumers. In a, so when they organized the occupation of the food course, that was also another targeting pillar. So by swaying business pillar to their side, civil rights movement in America won. We always see the images of big speeches and marches, but these were just the tactics to show strength. The real sway happened when they targeted the right pillars, and they start turning this local right pil pillars in segregated countries towards themselves. For the fourth step, you say to, you have to seek to attract and not to overpower. How Absolutely. Can you, can't, uh, you can't attract people you threaten to win. 
and uh, the basically the the uh, what the difference between violence and non-violent struggle is in violent struggle you push in non-violent struggle you pull so it's a direction way and you really want to use the arguments to persuade the people to change uh, to your side and your idea is that you want to avoid any kind of divisive tactics and you want to avoid any kind of divisive topics because you want to bring people on your side and once this movement becomes functional and start putting the small victories then you can do the different stuff well there is this amazing uh, case uh, another if you're interested in non-violent struggle there is a list of movies you can you can watch and then one of them is uh, one of them is Harvey Milk the genius champagne blockbuster i think he got the academy award and there is this evolution of of uh, uh, crazy soapbox preaching, super loud, super annoying gay activist that you wouldn't spend five minutes next to. That was him at the beginning. And then he runs for the office and he loses. And then he kind of puts a tie and becomes a more mainstream politician and hires a woman to be his PR to the shock of his male gay friends. And he ends up being third. And then he shifts the game. And he says, uh, okay, I'm going to listen to my constituencies because I need to be elected in uh, city council in San Francisco. And through this listening process, he figured out that people in San Francisco actually care less for gay rights, but care more for dog's shit. Because at the time, the dog's poop was the big problem, the communal problem. So he launches his third campaign, he steps in a dog's poop in front of the camera, and he says the marvelous sentence, whether gay or straight, I'm the person who will curtail you of dog's poop. He gets elected, the rest is history. So by reframing the thing and seeking to attract people, not to overpower them, you understand the drill. Watch the movie, it's great. It's kind of a marketing 101 there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So um, you say the fifth step, and this is a little bit surprising, I think, but, but maybe obvious once you've said it, uh, is to build a plan to survive victory. So once you've been lucky enough to, uh, That's more, most complicated. Yes, how to, how so to like survive. In, like in, I, I don't know if any of you, how many of you have ever started the business? No, you don't work? Never, ever? Okay, so in business, in love, and in politics, there are like two different stages of every job. The easy one is between 20 and 90%. The tough one is launching it and finishing it. So this is the, the most complicated part of everything, is finding the 10 crazy people to start this journey. And then once you have millions, to capitalize these millions. A successful non-violent struggle are not only about the major change, change of government, change of rules. It is about making this change durable and new normal. This is the complicated part. When you look at the study of, of uh, these 323 non-violent struggles, violent and non-violent struggle, uh, you will be amazed. Uh, and when you intersect the society after the major change, change in the government, and uh, after five years, and say, is there a democracy, is there a stability, are people better off? In 42% of the cases of non-violent struggle, you have a good results. In only 4% of the cases of, for example, foreign in military intervention, you have democracy. Uh, I, I would love world leaders to read this before going to, to wars in places like Afghanistan. But what really struck me is that 42 is less than a half. So you have bigger chances to fail at the victory stage than to get to the victory stage. You understand? It's easier to mobilize millions and make Mubarak step down than to turn Egypt into democracy. So this is the tough part. And uh, we are looking at, uh, at the different things. We are looking at uh, unity point. How do you easily lose unity once there is not big bad man in front of the cave? Uh, you are looking at the thrill point. It is so thrilling outrunning police on the street. It's so boring sitting in the parliament. You want, so there are a million reasons why, why it's so complicated to survive the victory. There is no transition plan. A lot of these movements don't even believe that they will win. And so they don't think about the day after. And when you don't have a plan for day after, strange things are happening. So there are many reasons why it's so complicated. And when, for example, when you take a Harvard course, 20% of the course, because it's a for future decision makers, so a lot of these people are involved in this process, is how do you plan this survival? How do you turn your victory into something irreversible? It's not enough to catch the government that have stolen the elections and kick down the government. You need to create the free and fair election rules that are going to be unchangeable so you make sure that nobody's going to steal 
the elections in the future. If you're looking at this change was one of the crucial changes in Serbia, obviously, so I'm very looking much into it. But uh, whatever is the big change you want to achieve, you also want to look at the day after. How this change becomes irreversible. And that's the really tricky part. That's where all the, the, the real hard work happens, I guess. Um, Canvas helps groups all across the world. We, we listed the countries before, Burma, Egypt, Georgia, Iran. You mentioned Egypt before. Um, in, in these places, how do these situations div differ? I mean, you're, you're coming into these situations as an outsider and, and looking at them, perhaps not for the first time, but for the first time from the inside. Um, wh what is your experience and how different these are? Or is this all just a cookie cutter in a different country? Uh, it is the, we can't really tell groups what to do because foreigners never can. And in fact, the first thing we say to the group is that we don't ask us what to do. We provide groups with a toolbox so they can design their vision, their spectrum of allies, their pillars of support, their strategy, their tactics, and they can counter the oppression. So we are there kind of teaching them how to fish. And, and uh, the, the level of success, uh, if success happens, it's, it's their own success. So it's not really our success. But we measure the impact by how much they apply. Because we're following the situation, you know, after we work with the groups. In some cases, we works, uh, work with groups for years. Uh, sometimes they are, they are terribly unsuccessful. Uh, sometimes they are successful over the short span of time. Sometimes they are successful in a phase of struggle. And they can't deal with the increased oppression. So it's a mixed bag. It's very difficult to say, to say uh, that we are a very successful organization, but at least we are providing the people with something they need, and that skills and knowledge. And I think this is, this is what makes Canvas so unique. We are the only solely designed organization that provides people with skills and knowledge how to build effective movements. We don't try to give lessons in transition. We don't try to give lessons in political campaigns. There are a lot of great players on the market. You can go and ask them to do that. But you are into creating a small, growing, large, nationwide social movement. We are the one to talk to. Okay, and you've, you've been around the world with these things. You also, with, with Canvas uh, in the universities, you've seen uh, you know, students from many, many different cultures. Do you think that there's, uh, I, I mean, without wanting, asking you to generalize about, about certain countries, do you think there are cultural norms that you can say when it comes to uh, planning a revolution or planning any kind of uh, disruption, as you called it before, is, are there cultural differences there? It, cultural differences are definitely there. And you have uh, sources of power in every society, and some of them are universal. You are more powerful if you have more authority. You are more powerful if you can mobilize more numbers. You are more powerful if you can train these numbers in certain skills. You are definitely more powerful if you can fundraise more money. Uh, but then there is a group of, of, the, of the factors that we call intangible factors. And these are very specific for the society, culture, religion, region. And this is exactly the reason why foreigners can't tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. So you can equip with people to operate in this environment, but they understand their own environment. They know if the humor will work in Cambodia. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I can tell them, if you think the humor will work in Cambodia, this is one, two, three, four, five way to use it in the struggle. But of course, uh, what flies as a joke in Cambodia is probably very different from what flies as a joke in Vienna or Belgrade. And same works for, you know, what flies as a motivating, what flies as an insulting, what, I mean, these are the things you as a foreigner don't know. So you make sure that they make the country specific thing. Uh, but uh, whatever the battlefield, I strongly believe, uh, oh, in, whether in a, in a cultural, ethnic, uh, whatever, historic environment, or in the level of oppression, level of democracy, name it however you want. I strongly believe that skills you bring in a conflict are more important than the conditions you find there. Mm -hmm. If you have a skills, you would be able to operate, uh, to build a large nonviolent movement in a mostly violent uh, uh, history and culture, like in Serbia. And then if you don't have skills, uh, you can have the best conditions in the world, like in Zimbabwe, the aging dictator, large corruption, powerful hyperinflation, mass national discontent, and elections you win, and still you can't make a change because you don't have skills. So, I, I, yes, the, every country is very specific, but the general principles are the same, and, and if you build the skills, that increases your chances to make a successful nonviolent movement and eventually live, and maybe survive the victory. <laughs> and uh, in, on the university level, in, in your teaching, is, uh, are, are some have you experienced more, how should I say, um, 
uh, quicker understanding of, of the principles that no. you present? No. Slower understanding. <laughs> Activists are political animals per se. And uh, if you talk to the group of Harvard students and then you go and meet a group of the rural Syrians, it is very likely that the rural Syrians are going to be the champions of understanding the battlefield. So in my uh, understanding, uh, I mean, this is of course two very different worlds. And Canvas does three things. We work with activist group, we work with universities, and we produce tools. So this, this is like all you see now on the stage, you can go on our website and see a little animated videos that are covering the vision, the unity, all of these things. We outline humor. Uh, these are the two different angles. Activists live these struggles, and students and professors research these struggles. But we strongly believe that uh, this is a joint effort, because uh, A, we need to help people who are doing stuff, but B, we need to, to mobilize uh, the people with the, with the intellectual capacity, and I'm not counting myself there, I'm not a scholar. I have an MA in freshwater biologies, so I, I, I don't know a thing about, po I didn't have one single course. In, in, in political science in my life, though I'm teaching political science, which is weird. You can do it only in the United States. Uh, but, but basically what you build a coalition with people of science to make sense of the things that are happening on the ground. And I think the more it grows, and it grows uh, tremendously in the last, last decade, it grew from a few schools where it was kind of an exotic topic, into something which is regularly taught on Harvard and Rutgers and NYU. And it's like all of these big schools. Uh, University of Essex in UK is another school we, we, we have in course at. And it's amazing because working with students enable you to assign them cases. And then the students help you figure out the cases. So this is also very, very... Uh, for me, one of the beauties of this work is that uh, uh, you never stop learning. And this is why it is so motivational. You constantly are getting into new situations with new people, and you're constantly challenged by clever students to read more. So you can't really get rusty, which is what I like. I'm tending to get lazy and rusty and not read and go fishing, and, and this keeps me back. What's the best question that a student's ever asked you? Oh, there are, there are millions of, of amazing questions. But the typical question, uh, uh, which every, every, single, every single workshop and every single course starts with that, is that, oh, you guys did it greatly in Serbia, but this will never work in my country. So this is how it starts. Which is why the first chapter of the book is called, It Will Never Happen Here. Oh, well, the famous last words, right? Um, so I'd like to open this up to the audience. Who, who has a question for Serja here? He's... Uh, Definitely, definitely got answers. Yes, please. Uh, microphone, one second. Um, I would like to know whether you uh, have a, a closer understanding of the conflict in Venezuela, which is ongoing. And if yes, uh, whether you could give a yeah, you could give your details about the, the, the tactics, both of the opposition and of the government side. Uh, Venezuela is, is one of the most important world battlefields for democracy now, and uh, it is in a very sad condition. Uh, we have the government, uh, which a guy called Maduro inherited from a guy called Chavez, the restless campaigner, and... Uh, which basically crumbled down economically, politically. Now we are having the government which has no legitimacy at all. In fact, they lost by a landslide parliamentary elections a year and a half ago, but kind of buys time and uses the pillars of force to maintain in power with no legitimacy. Their key pillar is judiciary. So they're using constitutional court, actually the constitutional court stripped the parliament of its in charges because obviously the president and the ruling party, still ruling party, cannot control uh, the parliament. Uh, this escalated the crisis in April this year and uh, there were like uh, four months of everyday protests, which is of course tactic I would never advise. And I think uh, the main mistake of the opposition is sticking to the street tactics over and over because they're facing the government uh, that is not even using the standard the repressive mechanisms. Majority of violence is made by a paramilitary group called colectivos that are armed by the government and sent to kill 
protesters and basically the youth gangs. And uh, what happens there is that now Maduro found another way to buy time with inventing the Constitutional Assembly, another super organ with no legitimacy that will strip the parliament from in charges. But what he's basically, basically afraid is elections. And he wants to delay these elections because in free and fair elections, his numbers are under 20%. And, and he knows that. So uh, I don't think Maduro will last long. Uh, I'm more concerned in how many people will suffer till the change happens. Venezuela is one of the countries with the largest hyperinflation rate, uh, not only this year, but now getting into the decade. Uh, majority of the population doesn't have the basic goods in terms of foods or toilet paper. Average Venezuelan lost eight pounds or four kilos in the last year. So it's really, it's not only political crisis, but it's economical crisis on the top, uh, uh, political crisis on the top of the economical crisis. So even if there, there will be figure out a way uh, for smooth transition of power, which I highly doubt, uh, I don't think Maduro is the guy who's going to retire. I think it's more and more uh, drug controlled government. And, and recently the, the United States seized the assets of the Venezuelan vice president, uh, which are counting in hundreds of millions. And this is not the money you can really earn from, you know, selling, uh, selling uh, uh, M&M chocolates. Uh, so what's really interesting is that uh, I'm very hopeful about the change in Venezuela in terms that it will happen. I'm, I'm very, very concerned on how to fix and put this country together. It's economically destroyed. It's on the brink of complete poverty. It has unsustainable industry, which is set by Chavez on the oil, pro their main uh, revenue is oil. Oil should be $80 plus for this economy to be stable. Oil is not going to be $80 anytime soon. It's around 50 now for barrel. And uh, I think resetting the economy and also healing the wounds uh, within conflicted part of the society after Maduro goes would be more difficult than envisioning the day when Maduro goes. And, and uh, I, I, I used to work with student groups there in, uh, in 2006 before the first referendum Chavez lost in 2007. Uh, then with very, very different opposition players from across the spectrum. Uh, the unity is one of the big things. It's a highly politically fragmented society. You have 19 opposition parties that hardly speak to each other, and then you have the ruling party that speaks to none of the opposition parties. So it's like a, it's a big political fragmentation. So uh, finding the unity to push through transition is going to be equally, if not more, difficult than, than ending with Maduro's era. Just a message to speak, speak really into the microphone. Speak. Yeah, exactly. Speak <laughs> into the microphone, please. Uh, into, yes, like this. Like, yeah, yeah. Like a okay. singer, you can do the Brian Ferry finger as well, yes. I'm a singer, actually. <laughs> Hi, um, I want to ask, um, I'm a big fan of Canvas and the work you're doing for a long time, yeah? Well, we have funds in Vienna. Just, just came back from researching on the Cairo Revolution um, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, how you deal with uh, digital uh, strategies and uh, um, especially concerning like banning internet or um, uh, algorithms and, and different like changes of uh, how uh, strategies, how to deal with like protests and, and, and so on. Uh, the, the new media and digital world definitely changed the nonviolent conflict arena. Uh, sometimes better and and sometimes for the worse. Uh, from the better, it terms that, uh, that uh, social media make uh, assembly of the people faster, cheaper, and you have seen this uh, many times than in the past. Second, so uh, uh, the, the, the digitalized era enables you to collect data and information and report on human rights abuses. It's very difficult to hide things because everybody is the reporter. And also the thing I most, uh, most uh, uh, passionate about is learning. Uh, Nonviolent movements can learn from each other horizontally because then there is an internet and they can see what works. And it also enables me to reach more people. I'm, I'm, uh, we, we had a Harvard, uh, Harvard webinar last week which was attended by 500 people from 30 different countries. It wouldn't be, imagine, I mean the, the quantity of resources you would do, you would need for this without internet are amazing. But the bad guys are learning too. 
and uh, autocrats are becoming uh, very effective in censoring the internet, uh, tracing people through, through digital media, and even meddle with uh, other countries' elections uh, through hacking and leaking and things of that kind. So uh, it's a very interesting battlefield, and this technology is more like, like nuclear technology. You can use it for getting the electrical power, and you can use it for making a hydrogen bombs. Uh, we are very passionate about two, two things that are happening. One, <laughs> there is a growing movement of tech companies from Silicon Valley and elsewhere that are finding tools for activists across the world to bypass censorship. The great guy, if you go to the main room, there is a guy called Scott Carpenter. He represents the, uh, the uh, think tank called Jigsaw, which is basically the Google's arm for dealing with this kind of stuff. And uh, they are doing a lot of stuff on this. Uh, we, on our side, we are working on an app, a phone app, which will going to be called Whistler, because it's going to be designed for whistleblowing, but not only for whistleblowing. It will enable safe communication, easy upload of content with the metadata on content, but your anonymity guaranteed, which is the very important part of the show. And then, last but not least important, fast, fast response engine if you get in trouble. So people get information that you're in trouble, but also get your geolocation, because 80% of torture is not happening in a police station, but you know they take you on a farm and do their butchery there. So uh, uh, there are interesting things happening in, in this field. I'm a very analog person myself, but I try to find the needs of the movements and bring them to techies. So I think this marriage is very interesting, even if I don't understand technology at all. I'm that guy who can't turn the notification software. Yeah, I just wanted to move on to the next country where a government is trying to prohibit an election. That is Spain and Catalonia. Could you say something about it? I don't know much about it, but I had a very passionate group of students working on Catalonian referendum recently in, uh, in, uh, in my class in Essex. And I figured out that what is really interesting is that you're having the pillars of state against the pillars of state. So you have a federal state and then you have the regional state. And uh, on one hand, uh, there is, a, there is a, a very large number of the people and ha large mobilization towards this. On another hand, there is a s great reluctance of the, of, the, of the central government to deal with it and also readiness to oppress it. So I think finding the middle ground would be, would be the big challenge. And this is how you need to think if you're looking at the, at the democratic environment. And Spain is definitely the, the democratic country since Franco was kicked out. And I think there is a lack of understanding for dialogue from both sides. And there is a lack of understanding of the consequences. Uh, because on the side of the government, if they oppress referendum, there will be another referendum. There will be uh, economic and political repercussions that Spain really doesn't need at this point. And then on the side of the people who are standing for independence of Catalonia, uh, they need to understand that uh, if, they, if they leave Spain, they will leave EU. And it is very different than the referendum in Scotland for example, because you know Scotland is more likely to get back to the EU now, the Britain is not, or leaving EU. But if you leave the EU country by a referendum, then you're leaving EU. And they're not telling their voters this. And there's this uh, huge element of, of not talking to each other. And even there is a language barrier, because the Catalonian and, and, and Spanish, like the Spanish is taught as uh, English in Catalonian schools, like a foreign language. So there is this language barrier, political barrier, and lack of finding the common ground. And I think it's once again turning the adventurous spirit of the local parties into the nationwide problem. Because this is what happened to the Great Britain. Uh, the Great Britain would never go to Brexit if uh, James Cameron didn't want to protect his right flank from a growing, uh, a growing uh, support of the party called UKIP, which was Eurosceptic. This was ridiculous. He won that elections uh, uh, by a landslide. UKIP stayed on, uh, on the margins. But then there was this big promise, let's do the referendum. And then they went into the referendum and turned the Britain into the political and social and type of adventure that nobody in Great Britain will tell you how it can end. So before getting into these adventures, I would like these people to see, sit and talk in a common sense. But from the theory of movement, it's really, really interesting thing because you have a pillars of state against the pillars of state, which is normally not the way how it functions. Uh, 
I have so many questions for you that it's really difficult to choose just one. But uh, this question is about uh, North Korea. Uh, do you think that a revolution is possible in North Korea anytime soon? And why or why not? You, if you had many more, you should start with an easier one. <laughs> uh, it is a very unique uh, place in the world, and it is probably the worst world dictatorship. And we <coughs> talked and worked with a lot of North Korean exiles. And uh, it is very difficult to say what is possible and what is not inside the Hermit Kingdom, because we don't know what's inside the Hermit Kingdom. But from what we see from the people who defected and who are really pow powerfully struggling, I think there are some things that can be done. First, empowering the community of exiled North Korean in South, South Korea. They're not even treated as a refugees or they're not given any grant. Uh, pushing South Korea more into understanding that there are like only two outcomes of this situation. Uh, if Kim Jong-un starts the war, they are on the first line of fire. If the thunder strikes Kim Jong-un, there will be 29 million of zombies walking from North Korea straight to South Korea. So, you know, they need to deal with this problem. We, we were part of the group that was lobbying uh, uh, South Korean parliament to pass the law that will empower North Koreans. And then how to reach these people, this is another interesting game. And you can see all of these techies trying to find a way to get into uh, this, but I think, the, the, I think the truth is somewhere else. There is a group of exiled North Koreans that are doing amazing thing. Uh, when DVD as a technology was abandoned, which was, you remember DVD players, this, yeah. Uh, and China dumped 1.5 million DVD players uh, to black, North Korean black market. And of course, because they have no other access to media, they bought it. So North Korea lives in DVD age in terms of how they watch the video content. A DVD players has a very interesting feature, which is USB port. So what happens is there are a group of people and there is a Wired Magazine cover story last year about them that are producing and smuggling hundreds of thousands of USBs, mostly with South Korean series. South Korean series are far the most damaging thing because these people were brought in propaganda that you know their southern neighbors are dying of hunger. So if you want to look at the really subversive material, it wouldn't be the canvas books, it will be the South Korean soap, soap operas. So I'm a firm believer and they send it across the border on a mules and on, through smuggling and also through balloons. So there are ways to penetrate this space, and I don't really think if this is going to cause a revolution, but educating a lot of people inside North Korea about the, the, the outside world will be definitely weakening the, the position and the firm grip that the crazy, uh, 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 crazy fatso has over the 29 million people there. So this will be four easier questions. The first is, is your uh, canvas based on Gandhi's ideas? Secondly, um, what is the connection to Otpor? And thirdly, uh, what is the connection to the Arab Spring movement? And yeah, and perhaps you can give me some, I mean, is there something in internet to be found on, on Canvas or where to get some more information? Uh, Canvas uh, strength strongly for, uh, for uh, uh, non-violence ideas of Gandhi's. Uh, our guidelines is that we work with groups that are committed to non-violence. This is our first uh, point. Uh, Otpor is a movement dissolved in 2003, uh, but the people from Otpor are among the Canvas founders, and we are using part of the methodology from Otpor. Uh, as for Arab Spring, we work with uh, people from several different countries. We, as for Arab Spring, we work with people from several different countries, uh, namely Tunisia and Bahrain and Egypt. Uh, some of these people were involved in, in uh, active movements. Uh, some of these people were on the brink of the, of the movements. Uh, there are many things on the internet, good and bad, about Canvas. Uh, there is the whole, uh, uh, if you go to www.canvasopedia.org, canvasopedia.org, this is where all of our teaching and videos and free resources are. But also, you, if you really want to read the full story, you will go to the bookstore and buy this book called Protest. 
protest and there is a very long subtitle which I can't say, but if you put Srđa Popović and protest, it will pop up on the Amazon. Okay, uh, our time is up a little bit, but I'd like to thank everybody very, very much. Um, and one small, small note uh, just to our friend who asked about Catalonia. Um, I happen to have a magazine called Metropole Vienna in English. We did a fantastic feature on the subject of very small uh, regional communities that are trying to secede from the European Union. So that's a great magazine that's coming out in a week. So on the 1st of October, it hits newsstands. Check it out, metropole.at. It is the cover story. Sorry, that was just my little own plug. Um, I I'd like to thank you very much and thank Serdar Popovic for speaking with me. Buy his book in English. It is called Blueprint, Blue, 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 Blue Print for a Revolution. And as he said before, in German it's called Protest. Auf Deutsch heißt es Protest mit einem Untertitel, das der Herr nicht mehr auswendig weiß. Um, it's in bookstores now or on Amazon. You've been a wonderful audience. I've been Margaret Childs. And one more big hand of applause for Serdar Popovic. Thank you very much. <laughs>